turn first the moon and then the other planets into real places that had personalities and character and, and landscapes uh, in all of their individuality and weirdness. And uh, that exploration continues today. Uh, over the past few months, Japan's Hayabusa 2 probe has popped some landers onto the surface of the asteroid Ryugu, and about an hour ago, uh, the main probe itself did a touch-and-go, landing on the asteroid, firing a gun at the surface to kick up some dirt into its sample containers. And uh, we've just heard confirmation that the gun fired and that the space probe is now ascending again back towards its home position 20 kilometers from the asteroid. Uh, we don't know whether it got a good sample or not yet. We may not know that until it gets back to Earth at the end of 2020. Um, also today, shortly after this talk finishes, uh, at Cape Canaveral, a Falcon 9 rocket will take off carrying a boring communication satellite and an exciting Israeli lunar lander. Uh, some of you may have heard of the Google Lunar X Prize, which was this competition for private groups to go and land something on the moon, and no one won the prize because it was far too difficult to do, but some of the teams who invested a lot of effort into developing landers have still carried on with the project, and this is the first one to make it to the launch pad, a group of enthusiasts in Israel who uh, have this uh, small 500 kilogram lander uh, that's going to be put into geostationary transfer orbit and then use its own engine to slowly make enlarge its orbit until it gets to the moon. Uh, so, so this is kind of an exciting day for, for solar system exploration. Um, but of course, it's not only the worlds of our solar system that have become places to us uh, recently. And in the past few years, we've found just a bewildering assortment of different planets, different worlds around other stars. Uh, and the, a remarkable technique called transit spectroscopy is uh, starting to reveal what those worlds are really like, what their atmospheres are like, uh, and uh, turn them into individual places with their own personalities. So our speaker tonight is an expert on that science. So let me tell you about her. Um, so Munaza Alam is a New Yorker a real New Yorker, as she proudly tells me, but you Bostonians are not going to hold that against her. Uh, and uh, growing up, she would, of course, visit the American Museum of Natural History, but not to visit the planetarium, I'm told. She was fixated on the dinosaurs, which is fair enough. Dinosaurs are cool. Uh, uh, and it was only when she was a physics undergrad at uh, Cooney Hunter, Hunter College, uh, that she uh, became really focused on astronomy. Uh, and um, uh, the, uh, uh, the astronomy research group at the museum, there's, you may not know that the Museum of Natural History doesn't just have the planetarium, it has a kick-ass astronomy research group. And uh, Emily Rice there le leads a group that studies brown dwarf stars. Uh, and so Emily recruited Manasa for, for her team. Uh, and uh, you may also know Emily if you're familiar with the Startorialist uh, website where you can get all of your astro fashion like this. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, so I was super jealous to learn that even as an undergrad, Manasa had the opportunity to go to big professional telescopes to do observing, uh, both in the U.S. and even in Chile. Uh, and uh, her, her Shelley trip was funded because she, was, uh, uh, she became a National Geographic Young Explorer, which is a, a, a really impressive honor. Uh, and the National Geographic Young Explorers don't just get a nice travel grant to go observing, they also write articles for uh, National Geographic's uh, various magazines, uh, and they give talks, and so uh, Munoza has developed a really impressive outreach career, uh, even this early in her, her uh, um, situation. So, uh, so after her observing trips, we persuaded her to sort of peek out of the Big Apple a bit and come join us at Harvard for graduate school. 
and uh, one thing that that so that appealed to me as about astronomy, and, and same for me actually, right, is is that of all the physical sciences, I mean, I like you know we we like physics because it has this uh, you know it, it's it's telling you how the world works. We like astronomy because it's accessible to the general public, as is made obvious by all you here. And, and so uh, uh, Munoz has not just done her uh, outreach through the National Geographic Young Explorer, she's also co-director of the Harvard chapter of Open Labs, which is a group that uh, gives high school students, or gives school students an opportunity to meet one one on one with with real scientists, uh, young scientists, and so that's a great thing to be able to go to talks by young scientists, but also to meet them and get to know them and realize that they're real people, um, unlike me. Uh, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> uh, and so uh, and and so that's all you know. Uh, part of her wide range of expertise, but tonight we're going to focus on uh, her expertise in studying exoplanets. In particular, the as the atmospheres of exoplanets. It's just incredible that for planets many, many light years away, you can know anything about their atmospheres. And how on earth do you can we know that? Well, that's what we're going to hear about uh, today about weather on other worlds. I'm going to hand it over to Manaza Alam to uh, to tell you about it. <laughs> Jonathan. So today I'm going to be uh, talking about the work that I do studying the atmospheres of exoplanets or planets outside of the solar system. And I'm really excited to talk about this because I like to think about it as studying the weather on other worlds. We know that a lot of the, the planets in the solar system have atmospheres and that they have clouds on them. And so when we think about planets outside of the solar system, I'm really interested in whether or not they have clouds on them, whether they have hazes on them. Uh, and if so, what are they like? So in order to figure out the forecast on these faraway worlds, I'll first discuss how we study exoplanets and their atmospheres. I'll then go in to talk about what we have learned so far using these techniques to understand the properties of exoplanet atmospheres. And then I'll finish up by talking about some of the future facilities that I'm really excited about that will be available for use in the next decade or so that will really revolutionize our understanding of exoplanet atmospheres. So how do we study exoplanets and their atmospheres? So to actually set the scene for this question, I want to talk about the first exoplanet that was ever discovered. So this planet is called 51 Pegasi b, or 51 Peg b for short. It was discovered in the mid-1990s. And there's, this is an artist's rendition of 51 Peg b. Now, the discovery of this planet changed, or rather challenged, our understanding of planetary systems and how they form. Prior to this discovery, what we thought we knew about planetary systems was only based on the only planetary system that we knew, which is the solar system. But 51 Peg B was unusual because we don't have anything like it in our solar system. This planet is very similar to our own solar system's Jupiter in terms of its composition. So it is a gas giant planet, but it's really close into its host star. So in our solar system, gas giant planets like Jupiter and Saturn are farther out. They're, they're beyond the orbit of Mars. But this planet is actually so close to its host star that a year on this planet is four days. So that also means that this, this planet is very hot. Hence, we call planets like this, gas giant planets that are very close into their host stars, hot Jupiters. And since the discovery of this first planet, we've actually made enormous progress in the discovery of planetary systems. Today, we know thousands of planets that are out there. And not only that, but we know for the first time with certainty that there are more planets out there than stars. So this is a figure showing the population of planets that we know of today. These are detected planets uh, as a function of distance from their host star on the x-axis versus planet mass on the y-axis. And the points are color-coded by the size of the planet or the planetary radius. 
And when we look at a diagram like this, the diversity of planetary systems immediately pops out because we see that there are a lot of planets that are interior to the solar system orbits. For reference, the Earth is this black dot here. We also see that there are a lot of planets that are very large, gas giants, but that are really close in, this population of hot Jupiters that I just mentioned. And then, curiously enough, there's also a lot of planets that are actually intermediate in size between Earth and Neptune, and these are called super-Earths. And the reason why this, this diagram shows us how diverse planetary systems are is because we see that there are a lot of hot Jupiters and there are a lot of super-Earths, but we don't have anything like that in our own solar system. And so today we know about 3,000 or so confirmed planets. But with the discovery of knowing about all of these planets, the next chapter in exploring exoplanet systems has to do with understanding their atmospheres, characterizing what they're like. And understanding exoplanet atmospheres is important for several key reasons. First off, Studying planet atmospheres helps us, it provides clues for understanding the formation and the evolutionary histories of these planets. So we can learn about planet formation if we study the atmospheres of giant planets. And that's because giant planets acquire their atmospheres while they're forming. So if we study the composition of giant planet atmospheres, then we're, uh, we're able to infer what were the conditions as the planet was forming, as the planet was sweeping up gas and dust from its surroundings. On the other hand, we can learn about how planets evolved over time if we study the atmospheres of smaller planets. And that's because smaller planets can't hold on to the atmospheres that they may acquire while they're forming. They're too small to hold on to those atmospheres. But after they form, they can acquire what we call secondary atmospheres, because there are various mechanisms for, for, for this happening. So, for example, if there are volcanoes on the surface of a planet, the volcano can erupt and it can outgas material from the interior of the planet into its atmosphere. Also, some external mechanisms can cause smaller planets to acquire these secondary atmospheres, such as comets passing by and kind of delivering ices to planets that can then kind of form on and hold um, envelopes or atmospheres. Additionally, a planet's atmosphere can control its current day climate. We know from some solar system examples that this is very true. So uh, for the Earth, we know that our atmosphere has an ozone layer which protects us from UV radiation from the sun. Uh, and Venus has a very thick atmosphere that contributes to really high temperatures uh, on this planet. And lastly, whenever we talk about exoplanet atmospheres and exoplanet climates, there's always this question of habitability, whether or not there is life on these other planets. And so if we really want to get down to answering this question and definitively knowing whether or not planets can or cannot be habitable, we need to understand their atmospheres, their climates, and their compositions. So how do we study exoplanet atmospheres? Well, one of the techniques that we use relies on studying exoplanets as they transit or pass in front of their host stars. So here I've got a schematic that shows a star that's the yellow circle, the planet, which is the black di disk, and then the surrounding ring, the surrounding blue ring, is the planet's atmosphere. When the planet passes in front of the star, it will block out a fraction of the starlight that is proportional to the size of the planet. And that's what this dip here is showing. This dip in the starlight is proportional to the size of the planet. So the transit method has been known as a really good technique for detecting whether or not planets are around um, different systems. But we can also use this technique in order to determine whether or not planets have atmospheres and what they're like. And to do that, we can observe planets when they transit at different wavelengths, because at different wavelengths, the size of the planet, or the size of this dip, varies. This technique is called transmission spectroscopy, and I've got a cartoon here that illustrates this effect. So on the left here, we've got the planet core, that's the black circle. The surrounding ring is the planet's atmosphere, and then we've got the star. The changing colors of the star correspond to observing the star at different wavelengths. And what we see is that 
depending on what wavelength we're looking at, the opacity of the planet's atmosphere can vary. It can either be more opaque or less opaque. So at wavelengths where the planet's atmosphere is more opaque, the planet appears larger. And so um, that is because at those wavelengths, absorption by atoms and molecules that are present in the planet's atmosphere occurs. So we can back out what atoms and molecules are present in a planet's atmosphere if we measure the size of the planet at different wavelengths. And that's exactly what we're doing here on the right. So this is wavelength on the x-axis and planet size on the y-axis. And this curve here is called a transmission spectrum. Now the bumps and the wiggles in a planet's transmission spectrum then correspond to finger, fingerprints or signatures of whatever atoms and molecules are present in the planet's atmosphere. So I think this technique is really cool because it's very elegant in its simplicity. All we have to do is find a system that, uh, that has a transiting planet and then observe that planet transiting at different wavelengths. So the geometry of, of the technique is simple, but this is actually a very challenging and dif difficult measurement to make in practice. And that's because the size of these bumps and wiggles is set by some uh, parameters that have to do with the star and the planet and the way that they're configured with respect to each other. The size of these bumps and wiggles, the size of these features in the transmission spectrum is set by the size of the planet relative to the star, as well as some of the physical properties of the planet, such as uh, how big, uh, how hot the, the planet is, um, how extended the planet's atmosphere is. So if it has a puffy atmosphere, usually made up of lighter materials like hydrogen and helium, um, and if the planet has a low surface gravity, so it's very um, uh, puffy and, and uh, not as dense, then we can see bigger features in the transmission spectrum. So the best case scenario for observing the transmission spectrum for a planet is a large planet, for example, a, a hot Jupiter, um, that has a really extended atmosphere, a really puffy atmosphere, something that's maybe made of hydrogen and helium. And in that best case scenario, the, the size of these bumps and wiggles in the transmission spectrum that we're looking to measure is about a tenth of a percent. So that's very small. And uh, you can imagine that if we're pushing down to smaller planets, this signal is even smaller. It's about a quarter of a percent. So this is a difficult measurement to make, but we have had some success uh, in the past decade or so in, in measuring transmission spectra and characterizing exoplanet atmospheres. In particular, we can use this method to not only infer fingerprints of different atoms and molecules that are in planet atmospheres, but we can also discern whether or not planets have clouds and hazes in their atmospheres. And the reason we can do that is, for example, for clouds, they leave a very important um, kind of telltale signature in the transmission spectrum. That is the effect the shape of the planet's transmission spectrum. So if we have a, an exoplanet that has no clouds on it, a completely cloud-free atmosphere, then the absorption features in the transmission spectrum will look something like this, extremely well-defined. So for example, if we are looking at the fingerprint of sodium, what we'll see for the absorption feature is this strong peak that's pretty high, as well as this drop-off, these wings that we see around the, the core of the line or the peak of the line. However, if there are clouds in the atmosphere of an exoplanet, then the cloud will form this kind of cloud deck that truncates or shrinks the, how much of the absorption feature that we see. So if there are clouds, we would probably only see the peak of the absorption feature, but then not the drop-off or the wings. And so clouds seek to uh, truncate or mitigate uh, absorption features in planetary transmission spectra, and then they also flatten the spectrum. We can also learn more about exoplanet atmospheres if we observe transits at different wavelength ranges, and that is because different layers of the atmosphere are sensitive to different uh, irradiation wavelength ranges. So what I have here is uh, a diagram of a planet's atmosphere, and the planet is being irradiated by its host star. 
So we can see the different atmospheric layers kind of extend out. Here's the planetary surface. And depending on what wavelength range we're looking at, we can see deeper into the atmosphere. So in the visible and the infrared wavelength ranges, we can see the deepest into the planet atmosphere. And from work that has been done in the past decade or so, we have found out that when we observe at optical wavelengths or at visible wavelengths, we can figure out if a planet has clouds or hazes in it. We can also uh, detect signatures of absorption or fingerprints of sodium and potassium. If we observe in the infrared, we can uh, detect even more fingerprints, fingerprints of absorption for water, for example, or carbon monoxide, methane, and carbon dioxide. And if we observe in the ultraviolet wavelength range, we're actually probing a little bit higher up in the, ap in the atmosphere, so this upper atmospheric layers. And that's really important because it can help us kind of figure out if planets have atmospheres that are escaping um, or being blasted away due to uh, radiation from their host stars. So these are some of the techniques that we use in order to detect and characterize in detail the atmospheres of exoplanets. So that brings me to, well, how have we used these techniques in order to learn about planet atmospheres thus far? But before I get into what we've learned, I want to talk about how we've learned them. So the Hubble Space Telescope has been a pioneer for understanding exoplanet atmospheres. It has really paved the way for this work. Uh, the Hubble Space Telescope is in orbit around the Earth. It's, it's been in orbit for uh, the past couple of decades and has revolutionized our understanding of the universe. Um, and the first detection of an exoplanet atmosphere was actually made using the Hubble Space Telescope back in 2002. And this was work that was done by an astronomer who is actually here at the Center for Astrophysics. And his name is Professor David Charbonneau. So his work, for the first time, confirmed uh, evidence of the fingerprint of sodium in the atmosphere of a hot Jupiter planet. And since that first discovery, we have characterized in detail the atmospheres of a handful of planets. And what we've learned is, for hot Jupiters, that they have a range of atmospheres. So I've got a figure here that shows the best of what we know for the atmospheres of hot Jupiters. This is a result that came from a study that came out about three years ago. And uh, it is comparing the transmission spectra for 10 different planets. So each curve here represents the transmission spectrum of a single planet, where the dots are the actual observed data from the Hubble Space Telescope. And the solid lines are what we call um, model atmospheres. So we've, we fit thousands of theoretical possible combinations of atmospheric compositions to the observed data to help us interpret this data. And um, the best matching model is one that will tell us is probably most similar to the composition or the makeup of this planet's atmosphere. So um, this is data that was taken from the Hubble Space Telescope for 10 planets from the optical to the infrared wavelength range. And so in this, um, so, so when we do things like this, when we compare the transmission spectra for different planets, this is part of uh, an effort to do comparative exoplanetology. This is the study of comparing the atmospheric properties for a large number of planets. Now, I know 10 doesn't seem like a large number, but uh, it's the best that we've got because this is really uh, careful work that, re that requires a lot of precise detail. And if we want to get down to the level where we're certain that what we're observing is correct, we need to do a careful job, and that, of course, takes time. So when we're looking at the optical to the infrared for these planets, uh, we expect to see some signatures of sodium that may be present in these planets or potassium that may be present in these planets or even water. Uh, but when we look at the, all the transmission spectra compared to each other, we see that while some of them show beautiful peaks of sodium and potassium, like here, for example, and beautiful peaks of water, um, other transmission spectra don't show this and are quite flat. For example, if we take a look at this, this blue transmission spectrum, second from the bottom, looks fairly flat. Um, so what this tells us 
with such a comparison shows us that these planets um, to first order have different atmospheres. And when we try to understand why their atmospheres are different, specifically why some of these, these transmission spectra have defined features and other don't, we remember what the effect of clouds and what, how, how they affect transmission spectra. So what we see here when we compare all of these transmission spectra is that at least for hot Jupiters, we have a range of clear to cloudy atmospheres, which is exciting because it's the first forecast that we've had for a large number of planets that are far away. And this is also exciting because the, the data that we're receiving or that we're getting is not light directly from the, the planet, it's light combined from the planet and the star because that's the, what the transit light curve is giving us. Um, we've also learned in similar studies that the atmospheres of smaller planets differ from those of hot Jupiters. So similar to the figure that I showed on the previous slide, we can also compare the transmission spectra for a handful of small planets and see how they compare. So uh, again here, the dots are data that was observed using the Hubble Space Telescope and all of the solid lines are the model transmission spectra fit uh, to the observed data, and we're comparing the transmission spectra for six planets that are intermediate in size between Earth and Neptune, so what we call super-Earths. And these were data that was taken in the near-infrared wavelength range, and in this wavelength range, we expect to see some sort of signature or fingerprint of water absorption. But when we look at, when we look at this figure, we don't actually see any pronounced peaks or bumps at, around that wavelength which shows that these are actually a pretty flat transmission spectra. Um, if we especially look at this bottom line, this looks like a very, very flat line. Uh, and so we're still not certain why all of these planets have such featureless transmission spectra. It may be due to the presence of really thick clouds that may be high up in their atmospheres, so they're blocking any absorption feature that, may, that we might see. Um, the other option is that they have atmospheres, but that they're very thin and that they're not very puffy or extended, so we, they have very small signals that we can't make out with our current facilities. So this is something that we're still interested in figuring out. Now, I've talked about a lot of the work that has been done using the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, but I don't want to discount the progress that we've made studying exoplanet atmospheres using large ground-based telescopes. So uh, what I'm showing here is the Magellan Telescope that is located in the northern region of Chile at the Las Campanas Observatory. Um, this is just one example of the many facilities that are currently being used to study exoplanet atmospheres from the ground. Um, and although we've made great progress thus far using available facilities, I'm really interested in some of the future facilities that are going to be available in the coming decade that will allow us to further characterize exoplanet atmospheres. And I'm particularly interested because these future facilities are going to come online, they're going to be available in the next decade, and with these future facilities, it will really revolutionize our understanding of exoplanetary systems. And in particular, one of the telescopes that I'm very excited about is the Giant Magellan Telescope, or the GMT. So this is a mock-up of the Giant Magellan Telescope. This is going to be part of this class of extremely large telescopes, this new generation of telescopes, which will um, open the doors for understanding the universe further. Uh, just to get a sense of how large this is going to be, I have for scale on the bottom right a truck. So this is going to be a massive structure. Uh, and, of course, the GMT is also going to be amazing because it's going to be located in one of the world's most pristine locations for astronomy. Uh, the GMT is being built currently at the Las Campanas Observatory in Chile, which is one of the highest and driest locations in the world on Earth. Uh, and this is important for, for building telescopes and building observatories because we really want telescopes to be located in remote locations far away from cities and light pollution. We also want telescopes to be located at high altitudes so that we're seeing through less of the Earth's atmosphere when we observe, and that's because Earth's atmosphere obscures astronomical observations. And of course, we're interested in dry locations because humidity is 
and precipitation is not good for observations and it's certainly not good for the electronics of telescopes. So this is going to be a very interesting designed uh, telescope and I want to tell you a little bit more about kind of the, the design or the structure of it. So this is the um, first surface that light from far away objects will hit when uh, we observe with the GMT. This is called the primary mirror of the telescope. This mirror, um, the combined mirror, is going to have a diameter of 24 and a half meters, so it will have roughly the area of a basketball court. And the unique part of this design is that it's made up of these um, seven individual mirror segments. And these mirrors are a little over eight and a half uh, meters in diameter, or just about eight and a half meters in diameter, and um, they're about the width of a tennis court. Each one of these segments will also weigh 17 tons, and it takes a couple years to finish them. So it takes one year to cast and cool the mirror, and then it'll take another three years to polish this mirror. And the reason why it takes so long is that we want to make sure that the surface of the mirror is extremely smooth and doesn't have any imperfections so that we can obtain the next, po the best possible data using this telescope. So this is, a, this is a very impressive optical design for a telescope and this fact has not gone unnoticed. The GMT is actually making headlines. It has been called the deep space eye in the desert. Uh, this primary mirror has been referred to as perfect the news is recognizing that there is astounding engineering behind this telescope, which will be the world's largest optical telescope. And my personal favorite headline is a reminder that the Giant Magellan Telescope is going to be awesome. <laughs> and it really will be. And I'm particularly excited for the discoveries that the Giant Magellan Telescope is going to make uh, that are going to be related to the atmospheres of exoplanets. And more specifically, we're going to get really high quality, really detailed data from the Giant Magellan Telescope. And that data will help us characterize the atmospheres of smaller planets, Earth-like exoplanets. So uh, this is neat because the best and biggest telescopes that we have thus far are about 10 meters in diameter or 6.5 meters in diameter. But the Giant Magellan Telescope is going to be 24 and a half meters in diameter, so it's about three to five times larger and better than some of the, the current best facilities that we have now. So how is, how is the GMT going to do this? So just as a reminder, telescopes are light buckets. This is how they work. They, I, they essentially just collect particles of light called photons, and so the bigger your bucket is, the more photons you'll collect. And so the same thing goes with the diameter of a telescope. In other words, if your telescope has a larger diameter, you'll collect more photons and in a given amount of time. And so this is great, but then we, we really need to understand this light. And in order to understand this light and to, and to understand what it's made of, we actually need to split the light or disperse it into its colors. And that's why we need instruments mounted on telescopes, because instruments split the, the light that is collected by the telescope into its colors. One of the instruments that is going to be mounted on the GMT is called GCLEF, and it's, that stands for the Giant Magellan Telescope Consortium Large Earth Finder. So <laughs> this is a sketch of the GMT, and GCLEF is going to be this, this pretty compact design right here. Um, GCLEF is going to observe at optical wavelengths and it's going to give us unprecedentedly detailed, high resolution, sharp data. Um, the data that we're going to get with GCLEF is going to be 10 times sharper than the data that we got from the Hubble Space Telescope. So the Hubble Space Telescope in the past couple of decades revolutionized our understanding of the universe and it, we can't even begin to fathom what we'll discover and learn with GCLEF. One of the particular goals of GCLEF is to search for signs of life on Earth-like exoplanets. So it will have the capabilities to observe these small planets, and we are going to use this capability in order to find these fingerprints of life. And one particular fingerprint that we're really interested in is this fingerprint for oxygen. 
So most of the work that I mentioned so far suggests that we're looking for fingerprints of sodium or potassium, but with GCLEF, we will be able to search for oxygen. And we're interested in oxygen because uh, based on what we know about Earth and what is uh, abundant in Earth's atmosphere, we think that oxygen would be a pretty good indicator for life on another planet. However, even though GCLEF is going to give us extremely high resolution data, it's not quite as high enough resolution to, to dis detect and observe oxygen. But we thought of a solution. What we really need is to just get the data a little bit sharper rather than have a completely new instrument that is tuned to just uh, observe oxygen. We just need to fine tune the data that GCLEF is giving us and just make it a little bit sharper. It needs a little bit of a, a resolution boost. And uh, in particular, it needs a boost of about three to five times in how sharp or how resolved the data is. And uh, this is a problem that people here at the Center for Astrophysics have not only been thinking about, but they've been actively working on. So there is a, a plan in the works to put a resolution booster on the GCLEF instrument in order to be able to detect oxygen um, and conf confidently determine whether or not it is present in Earth's atmosphere. And so um, I don't have a picture of what this, this final booster will look like because it's not yet complete, but what I do have is a picture of some of my colleagues who are um, really hardworking and dedicated to working on this project, and they are currently testing some stuff at a lab uh, for this resolution booster. And this resolution booster will be exciting because uh, it sounds like it'll be extremely complicated, and I don't work in the lab or work on building telescopes, so, and I, so it definitely is complicated, but it's going to be a really slick design, and it's going to be very compact. So compact that it's going to fit into a, a pizza box. So something the size of a pizza box will be mounted on the, the GCLEF instrument and put on this giant telescope. So I talked a little bit about um, this the, the GMT coming online in the next couple of decades. So I wanted to highlight some of the uh, milestones that are coming up for the facility. So in about four years, within the next four years, this uh, telescope structure and building should be completed. Construction should be completed for that. And then in the next two to three years following that, between 2024 and 2026, we expect to have all of the mirror segments installed in this structure. So within the next five to seven years, this facility should be ready to, ready to observe. And this is particularly exciting for me because a few years ago when I went to Chile, it was right after the groundbreaking of the GMT site. So it was right after they had blasted the mountain to level off that site where the construction is currently uh, being done. And the site looked like this. It was completely empty, and I couldn't even fathom that something so big and so fascinating would be on this uh, would be on this land. And so, um, the fact that this is going to be ready for use with well within my lifetime, but within my career as well, um, is is very exciting. And so, uh, for me, the GMT is really representative of a promise of opportunity. Not only can we do exciting science, answer some of the questions that people have been asking for centuries, is there life out there, are we alone? We'll be able to, for the first time, uh, detect oxygen if it is present in any atmosphere of any planets outside of the solar system. But it also represents an opportunity for me to be a part of this. Uh, it is very closely related to the work that I do, and it's something that I can be involved in uh, very much in the, in the near future. And so, there's a lot of exciting things coming up, and there's a lot looking forward to, that I'm looking forward to. Thank you. So it's question time. I'm sure you'll have questions for Naza. I noticed in one of your early slides that you said there are a lot of Earth super Earths at the orbit of Neptune, but it looked like the graph suggested there weren't. I, I probably read it wrong. I'm hoping you could show that again. Yeah, sure. Let me pull that. So uh, what I meant to say is that super Earths are planets that are intermediate in size between uh, Earth and Neptune. So this is planet mass on the y-axis. So 
Neptune is about ten Earth masses, and okay, I thought you meant. Oh yeah, yeah, no, no, no. not that yes, yes. So, um, what other um, elements and molecules will GCLEF be able to detect that are that might be of interest to look at for in, in the atmosphere of the exoplanets? That's a great question. So, GCLEF is so one of the main goals is to search for oxygen, but the wavelength range that GCLEF will operate in can also detect um, some of the elements that we um, have detected with with Hubble Space Telescope, like sodium and potassium, but there are quite a few other elements and molecules like titanium oxide and vanadium oxide that we haven't yet been able to detect, but are exciting for us to figure out kind of the chemistry of planet atmospheres, especially when they're really hot. So that would be really exciting to detect and kind of figure out where they form and how they form. Uh, can you explain why the different wavelengths penetrate to the different levels of the atmosphere? Sure. Um, I like to think of it as putting on like uh, infrared goggles. So you, you look at a planet in the optical, you can see what our eyes can see or what our eyes are capable of seeing. And if you put on infrared goggles, you can see some, a, a shape that is just slightly different. And so, um, or if you put on UV goggles, you can see as something that is slightly different. So that's where at those wavelengths, at the energies of those wavelength ranges, we can see um, a little bit more of the planet's atmosphere. And so the effect is very similar to what I described for transmission spectroscopy, where the size of the planet is different at different wavelengths, except this is kind of a bigger um, kind of rate. We're looking at a bigger chunk of wavelength space or a difference. And so what we see is that the, the combined light size of the planet is different at different wavelengths. Well, the energies of the, the ultraviolet and x-ray are higher than than the infrared. Yeah, exactly. But, just, it, but that's the upper level of the atmosphere, so it has nothing to do with how far they penetrate? Uh, it, ex it exactly has to do with how far they penetrate. So that's not just a function of their energy. It's a function of which colors the atoms in the atmosphere like to eat better. Um, is a gentleman here? Yeah. Um, interesting to hear about the exoplanets, but something you raised made me wonder about our own planet, which is we have a secondary atmosphere. What uh, keeps it from dissipating? Is it continually replenished? Uh, that's a good question. So we're far enough away from the sun that our, uh, the sun isn't blasting radiation that is blasting our atmosphere off. But for example, Mercury is, is so close to the sun, we call it a bare rock. So it had an atmosphere that was just blasted away from radiation from the sun. But Venus, for example, is just far enough away that it can hold on to it. Yeah, um, do you use uh, like traditional spectroscopy also to, you know, looking at the signature of various elements that you can use on like our solar system planets? Uh, when the exoplanets move in front of their star and light from the star transmitted through the uh, atmosphere? That's a great question. So the, so the work that I do is primarily with the Hubble Space Telescope, and yes, so we obtain what's called spectral photometry, so that's taking a, a traditional spectrum as well as um, photometry. So we're taking a color measurement of how bright the star is at that wavelength as well as dispersing it and taking a spectrum. Um, so during transit, we get lots of spectra and lots of um, light curves or dips. Uh, I'm currently reading The Glass Universe. <laughs> I'm so glad that you're reading that. <laughs> Me too. You're all <laughs> reading The Glass Universe, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 Tell me my assumptions are wrong here. I'm assuming that you can only detect gaseous elements. So if, if you don't see nitrogen or methane or whatever, it could mean planet doesn't have any or it's so cold it's all you know frozen or liquid whatever is there any way to tell the difference to um, with current facilities and with current methods no but uh, that would be interesting for us to, to, to kind of figure out if we could figure out a way to do that in the future that would be very awesome <laughs> I was wondering if you know sometimes if you can look in summertime is there gaseous methane and then if you can see it in the planet's winter time. I don't have that, that degree of freedom. No, we don't. Yeah. yeah. The the limitation really here is that we're doing combined planet starlight observations. Mm -hmm. So we're <coughs> what we're see, what we're getting the information that we're getting is for starlight that is filtered through a planet's atmosphere. So it's not even direct yeah. image of the planet and its atmosphere. Mm -hmm.
That, that's a really good question. So we put oxygen in this category of um, fingerprints of life or biomarkers, but it's not necessarily a definitive um, indicator that life is there. We just think that based on the Earth's, our own Earth atmosphere, that that would be the best um, first start. Um, so we can do that, but to a, a large uncertainty. So um, I talked about fitting model atmospheres with those lines to the, the transmission spectrum. We can also do something backwards, which is we, f we give um, we give a model of the data and ask it to to give us back a model that best fits it. And when you do that kind of backward modeling is when you can uh, you can calculate how abundant these these molecules are, how much of them is in the atmosphere. But of course, there are large un uncertainties on that. So um, we can, but we're not very certain of. In the, in the graph that you showed what it had, <coughs> that had fits to various planets' atmospheres, and there was one you commented was really flat on the bottom? Yes. How do you explain it being flat? Because I would think there's got to be something in the atmosphere that's got to give some characteristics to the spectrum, and there's nothing. So, yeah, this has been called astronomy's flattest line, I believe, multiple times. Yeah, um, if that were and, in EG, that wouldn't be good. <laughs> and we're not quite sure why it's flat. So there's two possible explanations. One is that, so this is a, is a super-Earth, it's a really small planet, so it either has a very thick layer of clouds high up in its atmosphere that is just completely blocking our view of any uh, bumps and wiggles in the transmission spectrum. The other option is, is that the planet is small and it's got a very thin atmosphere on it, something like Mercury, and if it's a secondary atmosphere, it won't be made of hydrogen and helium, which was what we expect, for example, giant planets to, to take in as they sweep up um, gas and dust from their surroundings, the secondary atmosphere might be made up of um, heavier elements and materials. And so that those heavier um, uh, constituents of an atmosphere would lead to not a puffy or extended atmosphere, but a very thin one. And so for, for these small planets, the signals that we're also looking for, we're already looking for are about a quarter of a percent. And then if you add in the effects of clouds or a thin atmosphere, we're really beating it down to a flat line. When you say clouds, are you referring to water vapor clouds or clouds of some other material? Um, clouds made of what I loosely call as aerosols or any sort of condensate, any sort of condensate. Uh, have you noticed an optimal range in AU for the presence of the water molecule? And if so, does that translate to a habitable zone? Um, so the water molecule has mostly been detected, has only been detected in hot Jupiter, so giant planets close in, and so that's that doesn't fit <laughs> in the zone. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, with spectroscopy, we're, we're talking about looking at very small appliances um, for ground-based observing. Is the Earth's atmosphere going to be an issue? Do we need like adaptive optics to? Um, so, so, so some of the facilities use adaptive optics, um, and then there are just a lot of really good, uh, what we call pipelines. These codes that we run our raw data through that will um, correct for the effects of Earth's atmosphere. <coughs> Which method is GMT using? Is it adaptive optics? I believe it's adaptive optics. Okay. There. Um, if it were possible, would GMT be in space like the Hubble? I mean, I'm sort of surprised that it's on Earth, quite frankly. Um, so, so the the trade-off here is size. So, the bigger the telescope is, the, the more collecting area we have, the more light we can get. So, the better observations. Um, of course, we have the trade-off of the Earth's atmosphere. But putting something that big in space is going to be extremely expensive, and frankly, I'm not sure how we'll do it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Sure. So, following up the second question, so a few months back, a few years back, there was a, we thought that we saw a spike in the and in Mars, and that is definitely why I'm not just saying. Uh, and the question, were you saying here with GFT, for example, we won't be able to go 
So uh, methane absorption occurs in the in at infrared wavelengths, and so that's not where GMT will operate. But the James Webb Space Telescope, which I didn't talk about for time, um, is going to be the successor to the Hubble Space Telescope, and it will observe at near infrared wavelengths. So um, in terms of trying to observe methane signatures uh, in the next in the coming decade or so, uh, the James Webb Space Telescope will be the facility for us to use. What's the maximum wavelength that James Webb will observe? Um, it will observe out to 30 microns. So it'll do from 0.6 microns to 30 microns. So that actually covers um, a really a really nice wavelength range. Not only does that include methane, but it also includes absorption from ozone, which is another what we call biosignature or fingerprint of life. So uh, GCLEF will be looking for O2, but O3. Um, ozone will also be uh, something that we can go after with JWC. I'll, I'll put one in. If you could get uh, three hours observing time on either GCLEF or James Webb, which would you prefer and why? <laughs> <laughs> this is such a tough question. It's not fair. <laughs> but I, so the caveat would be if I could go to the GMT, then I would absolutely want to travel down to Chile and see this telescope. Um, if I couldn't go to GMT, then I would want to uh, observe with James Webb because it's a giant space telescope. And, and, and you could get better data. And I can get better data, exactly. <laughs> would it make sense for the science fac factors that you're trying to do to, to schedule simultaneous observations with both facilities? That's a, that's a, is any of that going on? That's a great idea. People have been trying to do that, especially because um, sometimes we will observe one planet from the ground and also from space, but at different times. And uh, we might pick up a signature of absorption from something from the space-based data, but not the, not the ground-based data, or vice versa. So we're never sure whether it's a weather effect or um, the way that we're processing the data. So that would actually be a really great way to, to disentangle what is causing those discrepancies, if any. If the James Webb is so much better, why are we bothered with the GMT? <laughs> that, that's a really great question. So for, for a couple of reasons. Um, once, I, I don't want to say, I'm going to like knock on wood, once Hubble doesn't observe anymore, we won't have any facilities that observe at optical wavelengths. And optical wavelengths are extremely important for uh, determining whether or not planets have clouds. If planets have clouds, then we're not going to see any uh, signatures of absorption in the near infrared, where Dave James Webb will observe. So we need to observe planets in the optical first to see if we'll get good near infrared data. With that being said, space-based data is always better because we don't have to worry about the Earth's atmosphere and its space, so we'll get more precise data. But it's extremely expensive to get space to, to get time on a space telescope. And so you'll get less time on a space telescope than you will on a ground-based telescope. So you can observe more things and more frequently using the ground. So it would benefit us to, to have a ground-based facility. That's why my question to her was unfair, because the real choice is would you like an hour on James Webb or five whole nights on the <laughs> HD, <laughs> right? And then, I think we decided, plus, on a ground-based telescope, two years later, you can go put a new instrument on it. Yeah. And, and so there are a lot of advantages to the ground base that you don't immediately see beyond sheer power. It doesn't get hit by space debris, for example. Well, let's add, add an L2, hopefully that wouldn't be a problem for when. Um, actually, yeah, you have to, uh, I was just going to ask, uh, since the transit times vary on the planets going around the stars, um, is there a... Is there a sweet spot as far as like we need exact at least as much time to really get the data we want to see, and you sort of compensate for the stuff that planets that have fast transit times. You just make a point to go back in four days and look again, so it sort of evens out. Uh, that's a great question. So transit times vary most significantly for systems that have multiple planets in them. Um, most of the planets, for example, that I'm working with have one planet in them or one that's really, really, or another that's really, really far out. 
Um, but because we always want to account for either errors in the in our own calculations of when the transit is going to occur, or for the fact that there are real physical transit timing variations, we give a very long window of time um, for when we schedule the observations. So that includes a plenty of time before the transit and plenty of time after the transit. So that should be able to help us um, if we're a little bit off and when the transit is going to occur. So even if it occurs at the beginning of that window, we'll get a little bit of time before the transit and a lot of time out of the transit or vice versa. How long are those transits when you mentioned the, the hot Jupiter that, that uh, revolves around the star every four days? How long is your transit time? Um, so yeah, it depends on the the orbital period and the and the distance from the star. But some of these transits are a couple hours, and some are like tens of hours too. On the top there. I, so I think you mentioned earlier that essentially, like say super Earth, you, we haven't found evidence of water there yet. Any of those types of planets? Yes. Is that because we haven't found the right planet yet that does have water, or is it a limitation of the equipment we have so far looking at those planets? So I'll actually um, clarify that statement before, even further. We haven't actually detected any signatures of any absorption from a super Earth atmosphere ever. Of any, any type? Yes. So we have only ever detected signatures of absorption in, in hot Jupiters. Okay. All of the super Earth atmospheres that we have, the best data, is all flat like this. Okay. So we've never detected any water. We haven't detected anything. Okay. Um, and this might be... Uh, something physical, like there are clouds. It might be the fact that they have really thin atmospheres um, that are made of very heav heavy kind of constituents. Um, or it could be that the signals are really small and we just don't have the facilities yet to pick up the signals. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I'm just looking at that graph there. I'm really interested by the, the things that go up and down. I would think there would be a straight line. How is it that the, you know, you're getting a uh, more at this temperature, more here than less, than more than what? What's going on there? Oh, yeah. So um, the these bumps and wiggles aren't significant enough for to, for us to attribute to um, the, the presence of clouds and hazes, but uh, there's also a possibility that just so when we when we look at different wavelengths, we have much we have much fewer photons. So the, the uncertainty is much larger. So we see a lot of scatter as well. Um, so it could, so that could <coughs> be real or it could not be real. But Maybe there really are straight lines, just we don't, we aren't detecting. Yeah, I, and I don't think they'll ever be like, this is a very extreme example of a very, very straight line. Um, I still think there, we would see lots of uncertainties and, and wiggles, even if it was really, <coughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah. I understand that uh, hot Jupiters orbit very close to their host stars. Is it possible for hot Jupiters to exist in multiple star systems? Um, I'm trying to think of an example of that. I know um, I'm actually studying a planet right now that is in a multi multiple star system, but the hot Jupiter is orbiting one of the stars, not the companion. There's no, we've never. Oh. Yeah. So it's not orbiting around the center? No, no. It's only orbiting around one. Around one the, that, that second star, mm -hmm. the companion star, is actually farther out. So it's farther out than the, the planet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Messed up my observations. <laughs> <laughs> one last, and then I'll stop talking. Uh, in regard uh, using the, the game, uh, <coughs> ask around the units, how far do binary stars revolve around? <coughs> Oh, that's a good question. I don't work on binary stars. Right. Um, Huge range. Yeah, yeah. but it, it's a large range. <laughs> From touching to, to light years apart. Uh, there's actually a question with facts. Sometimes we say that the sun may Yeah, it's called Nemesis. <laughs> I was going to say, so in this graph, is it correct in distance? Um, that that distance effect gets canceled out when we when we process the data, so we don't need to correct for distance. So we're not something. We're not something. Super 
Uh, well, most of most of the planets that we're looking at are close enough. For they're all fairly close, so we're not looking at anything particularly far away. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Could you go back to your um, Pegasus B slide, please? Sure. And could you just um, talk about the the sizes of that star versus our sun? And that planet versus Jupiter. Yeah. yeah so um, I don't remember off the top of my head, but the star 51 Peg is a sun-like star, um, and 51 Peg B is it's a hot Jupiter, so it's a little bit more inflated than uh, our Jupiter. Our own Jupiter. Yeah. But that's it's amazing. Four day transit. Four days, and that's actually a fairly uh, long period for a hot Jupiter. Um, some hot Jupiters orbit in less than two-day orbits, or even like less than one-day orbits, or even less. Do we know that distance approximately uh, between that sun, with that sun and, and Pegasus? <coughs> uh, I don't know it off the top of my head. Okay. Okay. So it, it seems that all the uh, planets that you've studied are not Earth-like. I mean, we're, we're told that there are more planets than stars in the universe and in the Milky Way galaxy. And so there must be some Earth-like planets, but are we having too hard a problem, or too hard a time finding them? Are they really out there, or? That is a very astute observation <laughs> that you've made. So um, actually, so we found a lot of hot Jupiters in the beginning, but what we found, especially when we look at the planet population, is that they're actually one of the more rare types of planets that form in the solar system, in the universe. Um, and the more common types of planets are super-Earths. Um, the reason why we have thus far studied hot Jupiters in more depth is because they were the easiest to find. So we found them first. And they're also the easiest to study because they have the biggest signals. Um, for super-Earths, we are finding more and more of them. There's a lot of dedicated surveys both from the ground, some are even run from here at the Center for Astrophysics, and also from space that are finding some of the um, Earth-like planets that are around some of the nearest and brightest stars. I don't know if you've heard of the, the TESS satellite, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. So TESS is dedicated to finding Earth-like planets, small planets that are around the closest, brightest stars to us. Um, so we, we're finding many of them, but it's just difficult to characterize them. So we haven't had any bona fide good data and precise detections besides those six planets that I just showed. All right, so uh, we'll take one more question, preferably from someone who hasn't made a question before. Second, quick one. Will we, this is all talk about transit uh, observing techniques. Will we ever, will the James Webb or other scopes allow us to directly observe atmospheres? Because we're going to be seeing more exoplanets with direct optical observation. Right? Yeah, so um, there are some, there are about two big projects that I know of that do uh, direct imaging of exoplanets. That's a configuration that is probably even more rare than transits because you have to <coughs> see uh, you're looking at planets that are very far away from their from their stars. Um, there are campaigns and um, plans to do direct imaging with James Webb, which will be very exciting. Will that show atmosphere? Can we get spectroscopy data off that? Yeah, we have some really oh, low really? resolution spectroscopy from direct imaging thus far, but it, oh, these okay. are from ground-based facilities. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.